approval of aspartame. Several new studies were submitted along with their application. Three of the five FDA scientists responsible for reviewing brain tumor issues advised against the approval of aspartame. Under the watch of the new FDA commissioner, Arthur Hull Hayes, the panel lawyer assigned a new panel member to eventually achieve a 3 to 3 split over aspartame. On July 18, 1981, Arthur Hull Hayes overruled the Public Board of Inquiry to approve aspartame for use in dry foods. Furthermore, the FDA impaneled its own panel to review the Public Board of Inquiry. Three of those people were assigned to review the cancer part of the Public Board of Inquiry, the part that said you can't market it. Those three scientists, every single one of them said, we agree with the Public Board of Inquiry. These are three FDA senior scientists. We agree with the Public Board of Inquiry. They met with the commissioner the night before he announced that he was going to approve NutraSweet and begged him not to approve NutraSweet. Animals just ordinarily do not get brain tumors. And this should have been enough to have invoked the so called Delaney Amendment to the 1958 Food and Drug Act. It says that if something causes tumors or cancer in experimental animals, you should not approve it for human use. In 1983, the FDA approved the use of aspartame in carbonated beverages. Under charges of improprieties, Arthur Hull Hayes left the FDA and was hired as a consultant for $1,000 a day by G.D. Searle's public relations firm. NutraSweet or aspartame is the most studied food ingredient ever approved by the FDA and not just by the FDA but by more than 70 regulatory bodies around the world. In order to rubber stamp it around the world you've got to get it approved in, other, in another country. Okay, so let's take Europe. If England were to find out that they wanted them indicted for fraud, if they ever read these reports by the CDC or uh, the FDA Board of Inquiry saying it's not safe or found out, you know, about the, that they wanted them indicted, naturally they're not going to approve it. So what they did was uh, Searle, the manufacturer, made a business deal with the professor Paul Turner, who was in the regulatory agency in England, and he approved it without anybody knowing it. Parliament had a big blowout about it, and the story was in The Guardian. I have a copy of it, but they did not rescind the order. There were no studies done in the UK, and it was uh, rubber stamped. Then, around the world, they could say, well, it was approved in the United States, it was approved in Europe, and then it was approved, you know, in other places. Uh, they used, to, they tried to get it approved in Canada, and they couldn't do it, but once they got it approved in Europe, they began to rubber stamp it around the world. The American Dietetic Association, the American Diabetes Association, the American Medical Association, goes all the way down the line. And if you were to see and read their journals and publications and see who the sponsors were and the people who were paying a great deal for advertising therein, it would make a little bit more sense. But, but the Center for Disease Control did an investigation and said it was safe. No, the Center for Disease uh, never said it was safe either. What they did, here is the Center for Disease Control investigation. And uh, it's a 146-page document. What it goes into, what was happening to the people, goes into cardiac arrest, it goes into seizures, it goes into liver problems, it goes into mood alteration, and it goes into death. And it ends up by saying that more neurological studies need to be done. Now here's what happened. If you go to the Center for Disease Control website, uh, you will see a summary, not this 146-page investigation, but a summary that contradicts this report, saying that it was just mild findings. And I told Dr. Satcher before he left the CDC and became Surgeon General, I said, if you don't take that phony summary off, I will put the whole 146-page investigation on web and let the world see what the Center for Disease Control did. And we do have it on www 
D-O-R-W-A-Y.com, like Doorway with one O. You can read this entire investigation, and this is the original document. Betty Martini and her organization, Mission Possible, have served as the lighthouse for people who suspect their toxin to be aspartame and wish to learn more. For over 10 years, she has worked tirelessly to inform people of this issue, often challenged by the pharmaceutical and food industries. Mission Possible is the central hub for prevailing knowledge of aspartame. Betty Martini and Mission Possible contribute to Doorway.com, a website that is likely the most frequently cited Internet source on this issue. A substantial find in my investigation was Betty Martini. Her work is an act of charity, and her sources are credible. And, of course, as the case histories came in on the Internet, and they were just coming in so fast that one day I got 12,000 case histories of people suffering from aspartame and crashed my computer. So uh, four support groups have been set up on the Internet to take care of these people because finally they wondered. They'd been going from doctor to doctor. They read that and uh, they realized why they had MS. They realized about lupus. They realized about diabetes. Many of them called just hysterical, crying, you know, could this be true? Could this be true? But as they got off, their MS symptoms disappeared. People that were blind could see again. Now the current philosophy within the Food and Drug Administration is, let's go ahead and we'll approve this food additive or whatever is in here, and we'll let the people prove that it's dangerous. They were calling the uh, FDA, they were calling the hospitals, the doctors, they were calling the CDC. I got one email from the CDC, and they said, you know, people are calling over here. They're hysterical about this. I said, well, whose fault is it? You did the most damning investigation ever done. I said, and then you put this phony summary up there instead of, you know, you should be doing what I'm doing. You know, you are the Center for Disease Control, and we're having to alert the world, you know, because you people sold out. And then you, then you get up with this very terrible equation that says, well, if this thing only harms one in a million people, we'll consider it to be safe. Now, harms, they say kills. If it, if it kills only one in a million people, the FDA considers it to be safe. So what you have then, by, that, by virtue of that, is you're saying that as far as we're concerned, something that kills between 200 and 300 people a year, we consider safe. That doesn't work for the 200 or 300 people. And so if you're going to do that, you better have, a pro, better have a label somewhere that says safe means we'll kill no more than two or 300 people a year. And I, I, I want to pose that to people because I've had a conversation with some other federal regulators and I said, you know, with all the technology we have today, with all the advances in medicine and science, people are getting sicker. Has, has anyone noticed that? Uh, people are, are buying more pharmaceutical drugs to, to cure the very things that these chemical companies started to begin with. So I'm thinking from the womb to the tomb, you're going to be paying money to these pharmaceutical companies and they're going to be manipulating the politics so you get to consume all of their poisons, all of the toxins, things that are totally untested. And we're going to see five or six years from now people coming down with new kinds of diseases, things that we've never even heard of today. You know, you have to take some responsibility for what you're putting in your mouth. But in this case, they have no way of knowing. You got the FDA lying to them. They got the CDC, the professional organizations. They go to the doctors. The doctors can't help them because they've been lied to, too. Doctors only know what they're taught. And they only believe what they're allowed to believe. So I think it was the year 1917, but I could be wrong. Somewhere in that era, they developed the electrocardiogram. The year before, indigestion was the number one cause of death in the United States. The year after electrocardiogram was invented, uh, myocardial infarction was the number one cause of death in the United States. So a lot of doctors are still back and on the NutraSweet issue. They're, they're still way back in the era before anybody allowed them to know anything wrong with it. So many of these things are prolonged effects, and of course if a physician sees it and they see a, a child with a seizure, uh, they're not going to connect it to the MSG or aspartame because they don't know about this research. They're not familiar with it. 
uh, they'll just tell the mother, well, I don't see how that could be related, you know, something you drank when you were pregnant. We're about ready to meet Diane Fleming, who was convicted of murdering her husband by methanol poisoning. Her attorney neglected to mention that uh, he was a big consumer, her husband was a big consumer of aspartame products, and aspartame breaks down into methanol and could have uh, been the cause of his death rather than her. That's a possibility that was never brought out in court, and therefore she got 50 years in this prison. Um, so we're about ready to meet her and hear her side of the story, so stay tuned. Describe your husband to me. Tell me what he was like. Well, he was he kept he kept himself a lot. I don't think a lot of people knew him real well. You know, he didn't want to socialize with people at work or anything. He was very driven at work. Like he never missed work, even the, the morning in question when he got up sick and he's saying, "Oh, I feel terrible," but he went to work because that's what he did. We had a weight machine, we had a stair climber, we had a treadmill, and he read everything he could find about how to, the right way to do weights, and you know, like you do sets instead of just doing it, you know, you do so many repetitions and stop for a minute and then do it again like three times, or something like that. He was pretty much obsessed with building his body, he didn't want to be fat, like relatives. <laughs> he started reading about creatine and said that he wanted to try it and he talked about it for a while beforehand. And apparently what it does is it pulls the muscle, it pulls water to the muscles to pump them up more. I was wondering exactly what it was. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, that doesn't sound like a good idea, messing with the fluid balances in your body, pulling water from one place, you know, putting it someplace else. But I think it had something to do with the recovery um, time, and he wanted to try that. And uh, we picked up some Gatorade. He was trying to decide what to put it in because you could mix it in, they said water or fruit juice, but water probably wouldn't taste too good, and he didn't drink fruit juice. <laughs> so he said, well, maybe Gatorade. He thought he could tolerate that, so we got the the 20 ounce bottles, like a case, I guess it was 24, it was assorted flavors. You know, he kind of tasted it, see how it tasted, and then sat in the fridge and went to the pool with our daughter. 